All right, so um, Shalom, I'm back. Um, call out me how about Shemiah was shy. I'll pray to see how about Shemiah was shy. So let's see. The third myth about this is that there was not a tight relationship between slavery in the South, and what was happening in the North, and other parts of the modern Western world in the 19th century. It was a very close relationship. Cotton was the number one export from the U.S., which was largely an export-driven economy as it was modernizing and shifting into industrialization. And the slavery economy of the U.S. South was deeply tied financially to the North, to Britain, to the point that we can say, say that people who were buying financial products in these other places were in effect owning slaves and were certainly extracting money from the labor of enslaved people. So whether you was profiting off of it or were purchasing it, you were partaking in the slavery, man. So those are the three myths that slavery did not cause any significant weight the uh, the development and transformation of the U.S. economy, that slavery was not a modern dynamic labor system, and that what was happening in the South was a separate thing from the rest of the U.S. Um... Yeah, let me keep going. Damn, I forgot how heavy this was. This is tied to the aforementioned myths, but something to remember is that slavery is everyone in 1776. At the time of the Declaration of Independence, slavery is legal in every one of the newly created 13 states. And for the most part, slavery is associated with the sectors of the economy most closely connected to the Atlantic world, systems of exchanges and markets that link the new U.S. to Europe, to Africa, to the Caribbean and Latin America. Whether we're talking about enslaved people working in Virginia tobacco fields, where they produce significant amount of revenue for the British crown, or people in the rice fields in South Carolina and Georgia, or the enslaved people working as dock workers or servants in northern colonies like Boston. Slavery is everywhere. But over the next 20 years, as the U.S. becomes independent and relationships in the Atlantic transformed by revolution in Haiti, the revolution in France and imperial wars associated with those things, several shifts happen. And, and large due to the resistance of enslaved people and some changes in ideology, ideologies, you see the beginnings of the gradual end of slavery in the North. Not because morality. So slavery on one hand shifts to become a Southern institution. At the same time, there is no longer as strong of a market demand for the products made in the South. The food products made for Caribbean sugar colonies, where the enslaved aren't really given time to make their own basic rations, create one market for goods from the South. But the end of slavery in St. Dominica, Dominica, which becomes Haiti, cuts off that demand from one of those main markets. And rice, there are hits to the market as well and so much tobacco gets made that overwhelms the market and the price drops these are threats to the market strengths of products made by enslaved people in the u.s right at the same time britain begins its process of industrial industrialization and its focus on cotton textiles and pretty quickly the price for cotton rises dramatically and slavers in the southern u.s realize they can plant particular kinds of cotton inland Almost right at the same time, the U.S. is ensuring its power of what would become Tennessee, Mississippi, Alabama. There is a vast new territory that's opening up when the enslavers in South Carolina and Georgia are finding out that there's a new product they can force people to grow and find a new market with. Um... Yeah, the first thing we need to do here is pivot from just talking about cotton as a matter of, pro of productive labor and think about reproductive labor as well. And reproductive labor is not just women bearing children, but all of the work that goes into raising a child into an adult. This is, this, work, this is work largely done by women, but also by family networks and communities in general. 
In the U.S. South by the late 18th century and in the case of Virginia and Maryland by the 1730s, what we see is that enslaved families and communities were raising children faster than adults died. So this means that the U.S., as it becomes independent, no longer relies on the African slave trade, which by the late 18th century is coming under more and more criticism. So the slave trade didn't have as much value as it used to. Because n now in the U.S., you're, you're reproducing the slaves by birth. They were, they were being homeborn slaves at this point, man. Enslavers increasingly shift already enslaved people in the South and West into what would become the new cotton territory of the South. It is a vast system for producing cotton that is ultimately fueled by the theft of children from their families and communities who created them. And those who defended the Southern slave regime would say, look, these are legal process. People are bought, they are sold. That's the nature of slavery. But alongside the theft of physical labor, this marks a theft of reproductive labor from enslaved people. And it serves as the crucial engine to the expansion of U.S. slavery. It is a set of internal slave trades created by enslavers financed not just by buyers and sellers in the South, but by flows of credit into the region. The bankers. Starting with the land speculation of the late 1790s and to give a sense of the scale in the 1780s, as the U.S. becomes independent, there is something like 800,000 enslaved Africans in the newly formed country. Through the process of internal natural growth, of the enslaved population, the reproductive labor, if you will, and the additional importation of roughly 150,000 Africans, so-called Africans, decades before the inter international slave trade ended in 1807, the 800,000 increased to 4 million people by 1860. Almost no enslaved African Americans lived in the Mississippi Territory when it became a U.S. territory in around 1800. But by 1860, the cotton region have around 2 million enslaved people living in them. Let me get this precept, man. It's the curses, man. It's Deuteronomy. I think I just had the, that pulled up. Uh, Deuteronomy 28. And um, thirty-two. Part of the curses. Thy sons and thy daughters. I'm going to start at 30. Thou shalt betroth the wife, and another man shall lie with her. Thou shalt build a house, and thou shalt not dwell therein. Thou shalt plant a vineyard, and shalt not gather the grapes thereof. That's called slavery, man. Doing work for, for someone else that's not ours. And not only in, in that time, because we were property, they, they raped our women. They did what they wanted to do with our women. All right? Worked you to death, so at times you couldn't even lay with your dang old woman, man. Thy ox shall be slain. Um, I must jump down because that's, you know, separate. Verse 32, thy sons and thy daughters shall be given unto another people. And thy eyes shall look and fail with longing for them all day long, and there shall be no might in thine hands. The fruit of thy land and all thy labors. Shall a nation which thou knowest not eat up, and thou shalt, on, thou shalt be only oppressed and crushed always. So that thou shalt be mad for the sight of thine eyes which thou shalt see. Alright, and that's exactly what this article is mentioning, man. We lost our families, man. They took our children. Yet you happy with them telling you, alright, here goes the holiday. You don't want real justice. You don't want them to pay for the shit they've done and still doing. They still eating off this, off this slave labor, man. I'm going to jump down. It 
The goals have they became more violent, of course. Let me read this though. This is the same things happen today. The first form of violence is the violence of the domestic slave trade itself, where people are chained and forced to march hundreds of miles or ship around the Cape of Florida. But after that, the violence is really in two forms. One is really a sort of po policing violence, something we're sadly all too familiar with today, that focuses on constraining Israelites, so-called Negroes, movement, you know, making sure that people don't leave the labor camp to which they have been sold. And with that, you see patrols and readiness from whites to question any so-called Negro they don't recognize. Boom. Okay. That happens to this day. Let me um, jump down. Now, that's pretty much it on this article. Man. I'm going to end it on, get these precepts to end this lesson through the Spirit. All right. So, look, this is what they've done to us, and that paved the way to what we're dealing with now. Like you said, we're still familiar with it, man. Let's get back to this Lamentations 4 and 17. And we're still dealing with it to this day. As for us, our eyes as yet fell for our vain help, and our watch we have watched for a nation that cannot save us. They hunt our steps. And we cannot go on our streets. Our end is near. Our days are fulfilled. Our far end is come. Our persecutors are swifter than the, than the eagles of the heaven. They pursued us upon the mountains. They laid wait for us in the wilderness. All right. So they, they watch over us like a dang old hawk, man. Or like it says, a, a leper shall be in nice streets. That slave patrol is now called the police force. All right. We have our bounds we can stay in. All right. If they see us in them white neighborhoods, pull you right over. You know. And they'll get your ass up out of there. Shit. The breath of our nostrils, the anointed of the Lord, was taken in their pits. Of whom we sit under his shadow, we shall live among the heathen. Rejoice and be glad, O daughter of Edom, that dwellest in the land of Uz. The cup also shall pass through unto thee. Thou shalt be drunken and shall make thyself naked. This is justice here. When they, when they go through, we've been going through, that's justice. Not some fake-ass holiday where you pop fireworks and steal in the hands of your damn enemies. You get one day off, or here's your free day. Then you got to go back to work for your enemies. The punishment of thine iniquity is accomplished, O daughter of Zion. He will no more carry thee away into captivity. And that's the point. It's not just slavery. We're captive. This is not who we are. We are not Americans. We do not belong here. This is captivity. We are prisoners. He will visit thine iniquity, O daughter of Edom. He will discover thy sins. This is Baruch. And I'm going to end it on this. This is Baruch 3. And 8. Behold, we are yet this day in our captivity. Where thou hast scattered us for a reproach and a curse. And we are reproached, man. The image they put up of us on TV. For one, they always make sure they got a token. Side of my Israelite, whether especially a Negro, 
But they is either Negro or Latino, man. It's always a token sodomite. All right? That's how they want you to be, man. Compromised. And then the other type of nigga, like on uh, the, the spoof, scary movie. Well, they say, you know, they're not going to interview a certain type of black folk. They're going to interview the loudest, most ignorant they can find. Because that's what they want to promote. That, why do you think Lil Wayne is on Ellen DeGeneres and ESPN? What the fuck you know? What, what you got to do with sports, man? Because they want to promote that nigger them, man. Shannon Sharp. Now, I, I, I happen to like Shannon Sharp. He's funny. But the reason he's on the, the ESPN is because he's a fucking nigger. What do you say? The yak with the black dog talking about cognac and black and mouse. He tossed his do-rag, uh, his do-rag on, on his wave cap, put the black in his mouth, talking shit to Shannon. I mean, to Skip Slocking. Talking shit to Skip. And that's their promote. They want us to be a repro- we're a reproach here, man. They can't show how intellectual we actually are. They can't put on mainstream TV and media how we actually invented everything in this place and we actually come up with the ideas that made this place great and prosperous. They can't show that. We can't get credit for that. Oh, no. But that's part of the curses. All right. Behold, we are yet this day in our captivity where thou hast scattered us for reproach and a curse and to be subject to payments. So there you go. We're not free. We're still subject to payments. You have to pay and renew a license. You have to pay and renew an ID. What? what I'm, I am who the hell I tell you I am. You have to pay them for all this. You have to pay taxes for fucking water. Freely given to us by the Lord, man. It's illegal to collect rainwater. Hell, even if you did, they poisoned the damn water, the rain, the damn chemtrails, man. We have to go to them for the one of all things. And like you can just have some dang on cattle and, and, and be self-sufficient, man. We go to them for the one of all things. That's a part of captivity. And to be subject to payments according to all the iniquities of our fathers was departed from the Lord our power. You know? That's part of our judgment, man. That's just what it is. Yeah, I'm um I'm gonna end it at that, you know. All praises and glory to Yahweh Bahasham, Yahweh Shah, Bahasham Kakadash, double honor to the apostles, Elder Great Millstone, and South Texas Brothers doing this thing in sincerity and truth and with charity. Shalom while Baba Ball. Slavery. <laughs>